Rick's a farmer now, but don't worry, we're not back at the farm, we're still at the prison. And he's listening to some depressing country music to ignore the looming danger of walkers pushing against the fence with increasing numbers. For some reason, their pig is sick. And again, Rick tries to ignore the issue to have a nice day with Carl. And well, who can blame him for feeling relaxed? Because after all, they've had 30 days without an accident. So what could possibly go wrong? The prison is now a happy little community, with everyone seeming thankful to the people in charge. Like this kid Patrick is kissing Daryl's ass for bringing home a deer to eat. It was a real treat, sir. And I'd be honored to shake your hand. Oh no, that's just gross, man. I can watch a walker's face being ripped off with no reaction, but the idea of shaking someone's grubby hand after they've just licked it clean from barbecue sauce, it's just too much. Random NPCs from the community are poking holes in the walkers to prevent the fence from falling. Apart from this woman here, she just grazes the top of his head. <laughs> and yet we still get the sound of her retracting her weapon from his skull. <laughs> This is the episode where Carol and Daryl's flirting goes into full swing. Pushing against the fences again. It's manageable, but unless we get ahead of it, not for long. Sorry, Pookie. And I can't remember if they become an item, but it would be nice to see. Speaking of cute couples, Tyrese is with the NPC head glitcher Karen. They don't talk about anything interesting. I just needed to mention that Tyrese now has someone in his life who he cares deeply about. I'm sure it's not foreshadowing anything awful that's going to happen, so let's just move on. Rick goes out to check the traps for food and sees a walker approaching a boar. But wait a minute, she's alive? Please. Please help me. Oh no, 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 no. Honestly, this woman really freaks me out. Her dead eyes and washed out face with the black hair. She looks like she's ready to crawl out of a TV playing the ring tape. Cindy, this bitch is messing up my floor. Please help me. She pleads with Rick to get the ball back to her husband as she claims they're starving to death. And so he reluctantly helps while being cautious not to let his guard slip. When he gets to the camp, however, he sees that her husband isn't there, just this weird lump in a burlap sack, and she attacks him while he's looking around. I wanted to take the boar. I just knew, I knew I'd get you here so much quicker. <laughs> he's starving. He's slowing. He needs something alive. She desperately wanted to feed Rick to her husband, and now that she's failed in that task, she realises she has nothing left to give. So she commits seppuku and asks Rick to let her turn so that she can be reunited with him as a walker. Rick, I guess feeling sorry for her, grants her wishes. Yeah, this whole sequence didn't really drive the plot forward, but it was an awesome way to show that not everyone left alive in this world is coping as well as Rick and his community. Speaking of which, we have two other notable members of this community that we meet in this episode. We have sisters Mika and Lizzie. Because Mika and Lizzie are younger and naive to the situation, they regard the walkers as people still, despite Carl trying to convince them otherwise. They had names when they were alive. They're dead now. No, they're not. They're just different. They don't talk. They don't think. They eat people. They kill people. People kill people. Self names. A lot of people find Lizzie super annoying, and to be fair, they're not wrong. Maybe you don't find Lizzie annoying yet, but just give it a few episodes. Mika's okay though, she too is a little naive, but she's younger than Lizzie and not insufferable to listen to. The best part of this episode is the prison folk raid in the supermarket, and the camera pans up to show there's a crashed helicopter on the roof, with a whole bunch of walkers trotting about. It's inferred that this guy Bob is an alcoholic, as he's contemplating taking a bottle of wine, and when he aggressively puts it back, the whole shelf collapses on top of him. <laughs> this causes the walkers above to gravitate to the weakened spot on the roof, and we get this amazing scene of the walkers falling through the roof. This walker's intestines get all caught up in the ceiling frames. It's some really good practical gore, which I'm sure you would have enjoyed seeing uncensored. Oh well. One of the group gets eaten, but the others make it out before the roof gives way to the weight of the chopper. Patrick excuses himself from the kids' book club because he's not feeling well and needs to go lay down. He later starts running up a fever and heads to the showers to cool off, but oh dear, he's collapsed dead. And then he comes back as a walker.
Despite my facetious tone, the ending was genuinely great. I love the mystery of this illness and the looming danger of someone turning Walker while everyone else is asleep. And the episode overall was a great start to the season. Episode 2 opens with an unknown person feeding rats to the walkers, which is kind of concerning, but not as concerning as Patrick walking into the prison cell and ripping out someone's vocal cords. After this intro finished, you'd expect it to cut to absolute chaos in the prison cells, but nope, everyone's just waking up nicely like it's a casual Sunday. Patrick spent the entire night feasting away, and now that he can hear someone giving their throat the morning clear out, he finally leaves the cell. Farmer Rick and Carl hear gunshots from inside the prison, and everyone scrambles in a panic. And now we have chaos in the cell blocks, with people flapping about and getting picked off by walkers. No one we care about though. Come on, it's episode one, that's not how it's gonna go down. Mika and Lizzie's dad dies though, and this is probably the one scene where Lizzie comes across like a human child. It's actually upsetting watching her try to pluck up the courage to end her dad before he turns, but ultimately not being able to because she is just a child. And it's good to be reminded of that. They discover Patrick's body was the only one that wasn't bit, and conclude that he was the first to fall victim to this deadly flu going around. So the group separate the people who were exposed to the virus to prevent further spread. And yes, I'm resisting the urge to make the obvious real life comparison here. Outside, Carol goes to comfort Lizzie, but it turns out she's not crying because of her dad. She's crying because someone killed the walker she liked. He said he was special and now he's dead. Why did they kill him? Why did they kill Nick? Stupid. Thank you. This episode has a key character revealing moment for Michonne. She refuses to hold Judith while Beth goes to clean up her shirt. And then when Michonne does agree to hold her, she breaks down. This of course suggesting that she had a child once. And I feel this gives the rationale as to why she's so cold to people at first. She's putting up a front to hide the pain within. And this moment of catharsis for me marks the start of Michonne becoming a really likeable character. Tyrese goes to visit Karen and finds nothing but a blood trail. And the episode ends with him discovering that her body and some other dude's body has been burnt outside. Tyrese is going crazy looking to hold someone accountable, and he picks a fight with Rick, who gets pissed because he was only trying to calm him down. In the cell blocks, people are succumbing to the virus, but now it's affecting people we care about, like Glenn and Sasha, I guess. There's a scene where Carl and Herschel are out in the woods gathering herbs for medicine, and I only mention this scene because there's a cool visual here of a walker covered in moss, indicating the amount of time they can survive without food, which makes the world a bit scarier to imagine. Carol gives her condolences to Tyrese, but then has a breakdown and tips over the community water reserve. What a dick. She looks extremely guilty, and for good reason, as she's the one that did the burning, and she later confesses this to Rick. Did you kill Karen and David? You got me. Yes. A highlight of this episode is Daryl stopping the car when he sees the road ahead. It is blocked by the biggest walker herd we've seen so far. And when he panic reverses, he creates a pile up of walkers that he gets stuck on. Yeah. I can make a run for the gaps right there. You think you make a run for the woods and you don't stop for nothing, you hear me? Tyrese almost didn't make it through, as he sat in the car for a long time in his dizzying state of anger. He's a real mess in the head in this episode, reflecting Rick's behaviour when he lost Laurie. You should at least let Herschel or Dr. S take a look at you, make sure nothing's broken. When they're in the ground. Rick takes Carol to a random town to search for supplies, or so he tells Carol. His real reason for being here will be made clear very soon. Daryl and company come across a car repair shop, which is obstructed by a collapsed tree, but other than that, everything seems to be okay here. <laughs> Wait, did that get you? It got me good, and I've already seen this a few times. Tyrese refuses to let go of the walker attacking him through the bush, because he's still going through his grieving process still. Which, yeah, you understand, but at the same time, it's like, really, bro? She was only in one episode. Back to Carol and Rick. They enter this house and find two feeble friendlies called Hippie and Dippy. If I remember rightly, these are just one-off characters, so who cares? We have fruit. Yeah, we got apricots, peaches, <laughs> you catch. 
Carol helps relocate Dippy's shoulder, and it's revealed that she learned to do this herself after enduring years of physical abuse from Ed. He put his shoulder back before. Learned that from Herschel? Internet. It's easier than telling an ER nurse I'd fallen down the stairs a third time. God damn. It's a dark but clever bit of character expose that I think is cool because it's her taking a bad experience and realising she's become stronger with her survival skills because of it. Sorry. Don't be. Just fixed what needed fixing. When they're healed up, they agree to help in searching the houses. Rick gives him a watch so he knows what time to meet them back at the first house, but when the time comes, they don't return. And a quick walk around the gardens confirms their worst fear has happened. Hippie's been eaten, and as for Dippy, it appears he's dipped out, most likely gone to sell the watch Rick gave him for weed money. I don't know if we come across Dippy again, but he doesn't come back in this episode. Daryl's crew find some sort of science building and find a good amount of antibiotics to help fight the flu outbreak. And as they jump out the building to escape some walkers, Bob falls down and he seems awfully protective of his bag for some reason. We're going to bat, man. Got no meds in your bag. What's this? Don't. I love that Bob has the nerve to threaten Daryl over a bottle of booze. Daryl, in my eyes, is equally a leader as Rick by this point. He keeps people in check like a professional chess player. What a sick joke! The episode ends with Rick telling Carol that she needs to go, because when Tyrese finds out what she did, he'll kill her, so it's in her best interest to leave forever. She defends herself by saying that what she did helped stop the spread, but she was way too quick to kill the infected people without consulting anyone else. Some tears are shed, and Rick deeply regrets having to make this call. This is Herschel's best episode, without a doubt. The only other doctor in the prison has the flu, so it's all on Herschel's shoulders to help the sick. He tries his best to keep people's spirits up by not showing them the dead bodies when he stops them turning, even though the people here are fully aware of what's happening. He's determined to give people a dignified end and then help the people remaining to retain their hope. Eventually, the amount of dead gets beyond his control, and while he's saving Sasha's life, a person turns walker and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Lizzie almost gets herself killed when she lures a walker into another cell or something. I'm not entirely sure what her plan was here, but she did succeed in diverting the walker's attention away from Glenn, who at the moment is a complete mess on the floor, struggling to breathe and bleeding from every hole. Hang in there, bud, you'll be okay. Herschel sees that the only other respirator they have is on the face of the walker he pushed over the bars, so now he has to wrestle it off without damaging the equipment. Maggie pulls off this shot with John Wick levels of accuracy to avoid hitting the respirator that she knows Glenn needs to live. Glenn is stable for now, but everyone's energy is drained and emotions are shattered. Herschel most of all, who's had the day from hell, and not even the good book brings him comfort at a time like this. Scott Wilson has my everlasting respect for his acting in this episode. Things outside aren't looking pretty either. The Walker cluster got too much for the fence to cope, so Rick and Carl set up a firing range as they made their way into the prison. Luckily for now, they had enough firepower to stop them. News has started to spread that Carol's no longer with the group, with only a select few finding out the real reason from Rick. Oh boy, I'm looking forward to seeing the fireworks when Tyrese finds out. Surprisingly, the episode ends with the governor in the forest keeping watch on the prison, setting up our expectations for how the next episode is going to play out. But as you're about to find out, it's not what we expected. Interments was Herschel's episode, this may well be the governor's best episode. It's a flashback to the prison attack failure, and we watch a montage of him coming to terms with the collapse of everything he built. His remaining soldiers abandon him in the middle of the night, and Woodbury burns to the ground. Then it cuts to him walking the roads, all grubby and unshaven. And the whole time we watch this, we have this awesome song playing called Last Pal Light in the West. My favourite part is when he doesn't even bother trying to fend off this walker, he just moves his shoulder aside a little so the walker slips over. This amazing opening sequence concludes with him spotting a young girl in the window. So for now, he's found a group that might just give him shelter for a while. He's interrogated by this woman, Tara, and also her sister, Lily. Lily's a pretty cool character, but Tara, boy, oh boy. I'll just let this part play. They were cool. Hmm? Found it. 
Oh, stop. <laughs> I cannot watch that without my body curling into a ball from cringe. Huh? Damn it. She's not a consistently bad character, but whenever she does this fist bumping, it makes me want to swallow myself whole like that mythical snake. Yeah, there's no way I'm going to pronounce this name. He gives them a fake name, which I can pronounce. Brian. Even though this name is fake, I think it suits him. So that's what I'm going to call him from now on. He got this name from the wall he was looking at during this opening montage, clearly longing for the same kind of love this Brian Herriot guy was having from these messages. Brian settles down for the evening, tucking into a can of tuna, and Lily knocks at the door offering him a plate of spaghetti hoops, and then instead of eating it, the madman scrapes them all out the window. <laughs> this pissed me off more than it should. If he did this to the spaghetti hoops that come with the little sausages in, I'd be foaming at the mouth with rage. That stuff is sacred British cuisine. Brian helps Lily's dad to get to bed, and he takes pity on his story of wanting something fun to play with his granddaughter. So he agrees to go to his friend's house to get a backgammon set. After finding the game, he also finds his friend has turned Walker in the bathtub, and in this rare moment of pity, he puts him out of his misery. After his return, he takes a look at a picture of the man he used to be, alongside his dead family. Before he leaves the next morning, Lily asks if he can help one more time to get more oxygen tanks for her dad. And Brian almost dies in helping with this, as the hospital is jam-packed with walkers. <laughs> Brian returns and it's soon apparent that he's going to stick around for a while as he starts bonding with this little family. I'm a pirate. No way. But then the grandpa dies and the road ahead now looks a little bumpy. Speaking of bumps, when Tara forgives him for what he did, after realising he essentially saved her from getting bitten, she goes in for another fist bump. I think I'm going to be sick. They all go out on the road as they refuse to let Brian leave without them. And we get another cringy part where Brian and Lily start humping right next to a sleeping Tara. No, no. What if she wakes up? And then what if she wants to fist bump while you're bumping uglies? The horrendous possible outcomes here are too risky for me to watch. The next morning, the car won't start, so they have to walk. And then a group of walkers force them to make a run for it. And Brian falls into a walker pit while carrying Megan. <laughs> Brian furiously takes out the walkers, gruesomely using a bone to prise a walker's head open. <laughs> it's pretty good. And the episode ends when the person who dug this ditch turns out to be a soldier from Woodbury, who I'm only just realising now is Ricky Verona from the Crank movies. And as I love these movies, that's what he's going to be called from here on. This opening's kinda cliche. It's a back and forth where Brian's teaching Megan how to play chess, talking about how sometimes the pawns die to save the king and whatnot. And then it cuts to Brian thinking about how he's going to take his power status back from Ricky Verona. So while the whole chess analogy is kinda cliche, this opening was well put together. Your turn. Brian goes out with the guys to look for a cabin that they believe will have supplies in it. And after clearing out the walkers, they find some beers to crack open and chat the night away. Everyone apart from Brian willing to talk about their past. I was an ice cream truck driver. So I upgraded my life and I became a tank operator for the US Army. Back at camp, Tara is flirting with the army lady, Alicia, and during lunch the next day, they excuse themselves from the table to go do something secret together. A quick game of Uno, or swapping Pokemon cards, I would guess. At this lunch, Lily says something that triggers Brian's insecurities. Well, you've done all right here. I mean this camp. It's the first time I've felt safe since all this started. Uh, place Brian I lived before kind of worked. You guys had walls, right? Yeah. It's the first time I've felt safe since all this started. First time I've felt safe since all this started. Verona decides to play some drunk golf on top of this van, and Brian gets to be his caddy. Look how much he loves being his caddy. They share some back and forth about Verona's ability to keep this place safe, and then Brian clobbers him with a golf club, and then drags him right into a walker pit. 
Then, during a raid of a nearby camp, they find that everyone's already dead, and brothers Pete and Mitch argue about the ethics of taking human life for their own gain. Brian sees this as a cue to get his new family out of there before leadership turns chaotic, but they find the exit road is blocked by a load of walkers stuck in the mud. So they go back to camp, and Brian begins his plan to overthrow leadership. He wakes up nice and early to take out Pete in his trailer, as the weaker of the two brothers. Then he holds Mitch at gunpoint, tells him what he's done, and threatens him into becoming his second in command. I'm running things now, and I will do everything it takes to protect this camp. The old governor is basically back at this point, even returning to his need to keep a Walker goldfish tank by rolling Pete's chained up body into a nearby lake. Easily my favourite visual of this season. I've never liked the fact that you can't see what lurks beneath the surface in lakes, and this imagery doesn't help my phobia one bit. The episode ends with Brian scoping out the prison again, but this time he sees Herschel and Michonne outside of the security of the fences. This episode is peak Walking Dead, so let's just jump right in. Brian takes Herschel and Michonne hostage, and he tells his group that they need to take the prison to survive, saying that the people currently inside are dangerous murderers, who are responsible for the destruction of his old home. His love interest Lily isn't happy about this, and starts questioning if she really knows who this guy is. The answer of course being no. In his RV, Brian tells Herschel and Michonne that they're going to be bargaining chips. If Rick willingly gives up the prison, he lets them live. If not, they all die. <coughs> Herschel does his best to convince Brian that this is unnecessary, as they can learn to all live together. He even tries speaking as a father to another father. If you understand what it's like to have a daughter, then how can you threaten to kill someone else's? Because they aren't mine. Ooh, that's cold. Brian leaves Lily and his de facto daughter next to the water, as walkers can't get across the river, so I suppose they're protected from one angle at least. Not long after leaving, a walker pushes its way up through the fresh mud that Megan is playing on, and so she's done for. <laughs> The prison shakes as the tank fires a warning shot into the guard tower, and they rush outside to see that Brian is calling out Rick to come to the gates. Rick tries to make the same pleas as Herschel, but Brian isn't interested and lays it out plain and simple. I have a tank, and I'm letting you walk away from here. What else is there to talk about? Brian gets fed up of Rick's resistance to leave, so he ups the pressure by holding the sword to Herschel's neck. Again, Rick pleads with Brian, saying that they can leave the past behind and make a change for the better. Herschel gives a smile, proud of the fact that Rick has changed his ways since they first met. But again, Brian doesn't want to hear it. Liar. While the action plays in the background, let's talk about how much we loved Herschel. When I think about my favourite characters in this show, Herschel is absolutely top tier. I love that no matter what came his way, he stayed true to his nature. He always wanted to help people and do what his Christian beliefs taught him, but the man wasn't soft either. He held people accountable with words rather than force, and he taught people to look within before acting on their decisions, kind of like a replacement Dow in a way. But I liked Herschel a ton more. Goodbye Herschel, and rest in peace Scott Will. I hope to come across other media you've been in soon. Back to the shootout, I'm glad to see that people are actually getting wounded by gunshots. There are however a few moments where it looks like a parody gunfight. We got Tyrese who's somehow not getting shot behind his kitchen for example, and the most unforgivable moment in my opinion is Daryl using this walker as a bullet shield. Now I know basically nothing about guns, but surely these guns are firing some high caliber rounds right? That shit would tear right through decayed walker flesh, and Daryl would be Swiss cheese by now. So in my opinion this looks pretty stupid. To add insult to injury, we then immediately get Bob explaining that a bullet passed right through him, <laughs> so decomposed walker flesh is somehow tougher than Bob. It really did add some sour to this otherwise sweet shootout sequence. Back to the good stuff, Rick and Brian are brawling on the grass, and Rick is getting the worst beatdown of his life. Brian is close to ending him when all of a sudden, shit, Michonne to the rescue. 
I genuinely forgot this is how he dies, so it was still very entertaining on second watch. Oh, I forgot to mention, as the shootout began, Lily arrived holding her daughter's body, and Brian acted quickly to end her before she changed. This is a nice payoff to him saying earlier that he now realises his daughter Penny was dead before Michonne stabbed her, and there was no saving his daughter the minute she turned. So while this decision to kill Megan seems a bit quick, it does play into his mindset change. Lily finds him bleeding out, and she's the one to close the book on Brian's life. I have no doubt in my mind that the governor is the best Walking Dead villain. Others will probably contest that Negan is, and don't get me wrong, when he's introduced into the story later, it really elevates the show again because Negan is an amazing villain, but when the time comes, I'll explain why Negan doesn't remain consistently amazing. The governor's character had the best balance of mentally disturbed and evil, and yet somehow still being someone you felt for at times. Even when you questioned his actions, you sometimes understood the motive. And I like the fact that so many details of his personal life and the life he led before the walkers arrived remained a mystery. With important villain characters, I like things being left up to my interpretation. And that's just one of the reasons that made him so great. The episode ends with everyone splitting up and evacuating the prison. Rick and Carl crying when they see Judith's baby carrier empty and alarmingly soaked in blood. <laughs> <laughs> We gotta go. Don't look back, Carl. Michonne somehow got left behind at the prison, so she returns to her method of walker camouflage, and then she finds Herschel's head snapping away, so she mournfully puts an end to it. Rick and Carl were looking for a place to lie low while Rick recovers from his whooping, and we have Carl suddenly being rebellious towards his dad, which might seem like a dick move, but remember that daddy was basically his hero, and he's had to watch him lose his best friend, his wife, and he lost their new home, the prison. Also, to the best of their knowledge, he lost Judith too, so his faith in him is a little tested. Plus, he's tired of being treated like a kid who can't handle walkers by himself. Hey, asshole! Hey, shit face! Watch your mouth! Are you kidding me? The tension continues into the night, where Rick gets tired of his back chatting and refusal to eat when advised to. I don't want any. Eat it. Now. We then cut to a dream Michonne is having, having dinner with her son, boyfriend, and friend, I think. And when she looks back at them, they got no arms, and also the world outside is falling apart. I like it. Then she wakes up inside a car, with her walker companions cleverly tethered inside to provide protection. Rick, on the other hand, isn't waking up, and Carl is getting panicky about it, and all this commotion attracts some walkers outside. He lures them away from the house before shooting them, for whatever reason. But then he gets himself caught out by another walker nearby, and he struggles to get free from the situation. He then searches around for supplies, and comes across this giant tin of chocolate pudding. I don't know why, but watching him eat this pudding while sitting on the rooftop is just super relaxing to me. It's the perfect visual that says, yeah, the world might be falling to shit, and I could die at any moment, but on the positive side, I have chocolate pudding. Before he got to the rooftop, he had a close encounter with another walker, and this was the most intense struggle I've seen with a walker so far. He was way out of his depth in this situation, with no one around to save him. This made him realise how much he actually does rely on his dad for protection. And later on, when he thinks he's dead and turning into a walker, that moment of realisation peaks. <laughs> I can't. I was wrong. I gotta admit, the first time seeing this, I was almost convinced that he was turned. But nope, it's a fooled you moment. Don't Stay safe. He just had to crawl his way over to Carl like this, just to tell him not to go outside as it's not safe. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he could have just said that from the sofa. Michonne is starting to give up hope, being out on the road by herself. But then she rejoices to see Rick and Carl inside the house. It's 
for you. Beth and Daryl fled the prison together, and Daryl has lost faith that anyone else survived, whereas Beth remains eager to keep looking, asking him to try and have just a little faith. Faith ain't done shit for us. She was hell didn't do nothing for your father. I would say now is probably a good time to say sorry, Daryl. No? Okay, then. Daryl does say something, though, that I really have to question. Oh, got walker tracks all up and down here. Walker tracks? What do you mean, walker tracks? They have human feet and wear human shoes because they were humans. How can you possibly tell the difference between walker tracks and the tracks of a human who's just walking weird or drunk or injured? Do these particular tracks smell like death? Lizzie and Mika made it with the help of Tyrese, who turns round to reveal he's had Judith the whole time. Poor Tyrese. He's got a crying baby, a scared little girl, and a psychopath to deal with. A psychopath who almost smothers the baby to stop it crying. Tyrese has to leave them temporarily to go check out some screaming nearby. And once he's finished killing the walkers, he hears Carol's voice. Tyrese. Of all the people, eh? Tyrese doesn't know what she did yet, so naturally, he's super pleased to see her. I genuinely can't remember how he reacts when he does find out, so it'll be a cool surprise. Well, I'm assuming it will be anyway. They find a sign on a train carriage informing them of a refuge at the end of the tracks called Terminus. Maggie, Bob and Sasha are together and they come across this prison bus where Maggie clings to hope that she'll find Glenn inside. But instead, it's just a bunch of walkers. Glenn is alive, however. He was just the last to wake up after being knocked out by cannon fire. He puts on a riot suit and goes to leave the prison, but then he sees Tara moping about, feeling sorry for herself for being partially responsible for the destruction of his home. She's also sad because her love interest died. Yeah, I'd be crying too. She was kind of hot. To make it up to him, she helps him escape the prison. And while defending his passed out body later on, a truck pulls up with some fresh new faces to meet in the next episode. You got a damn mouth on you, you know that? What else you got? This episode shows Michonne trying to bond with Carl, and it doesn't get off to a great start when Carl starts talking about how much he hates soy milk. I would rather have powdered milk than to have to drink that stuff again. I would rather have Judas formula. Yeah, that felt perfectly natural. Why would we do another take? Michonne tries and fails to make him laugh as the day goes on, but he does acknowledge the earnest attempt. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at making boys your age laugh. I was laughing. Inside. As they raid a house together, she starts to reveal some personal information, like her baby son, Andre. And I really like that she's finally confiding in someone, so we, the audience, can finally learn more about her. Meanwhile, as Rick is laying on the bed, he hears some people have entered the house, so he quickly slides under the bed. Some guy comes up and flumps down on top of him, meaning he's going to be stuck there until the guy is in a deep sleep. As Rick tries for the exit, he quickly gets diverted to the bathroom, where hilariously one of the strangers is making brownies. They scuffle and he chokes the stranger out, and then has the genius idea of opening the door a little and exiting through the window, so that when the stranger turns Walker, he'll walk into the house and create mayhem, which makes for a nice distraction. Son of a bitch. No. Glenn wakes up in the back of an army truck and demands them to stop so he can make his way back to Maggie. Where the hell are you going? Where the hell's he going? Before we continue on, let's introduce these new people. Abraham is a US Army sergeant who takes pleasure in killing walkers. Oh, honey, look at you. You're a damn mess. And he's made it his mission to transport this man, Eugene, to Washington, DC, as he's a scientist who claims he knows the cure for the outbreak. Along on this mission is another US military personnel, and her name is Rosita. Get out of here, Maggie, and whoever this was. Abraham tries to stop Glenn and gets punched in the nose for it. Pretty ballsy to punch an army sergeant, mate. And as expected, he gets a whooping right back. As the ladies try to break them up, Eugene tries to take out the walkers all by himself. But because he's an incompetent boob, he shoots the petrol tank full of holes. 
Abraham concedes that they might as well walk in Glenn's direction in the hopes of finding another car. The episode ends with Rick, Michonne and Carl coming across the Terminus sign, so there's hope that the gang will be back together soon. I remember hating this episode when it first came out because absolutely nothing happened. It's just Beth and Daryl walking around together talking. But on second watch, I can appreciate the character building that goes on here. And there were a few good moments. The opening especially is the most visually pleasing and exciting so far. They hide out in the trunk of a car while a massive walker herd passes by. And there's also a big storm going on, which adds a layer of suspense. <laughs> While eating a snake for breakfast, which actually looks quite nice, Beth insists that she wants to try booze for the first time, as Daddy never let her before. Which, yeah, of course he wouldn't. <laughs> Why would he let you drink? You were only 17 at the time. So off they go to a nearby golf club to see if they can score some booze. And I know it's a small detail, but it's cool that we get to see Beth picking out new clothes. I feel like an essential part of their survival is finding fresh warm clothes to wear, or just any clothes that aren't covered in walker guts. But it's not something we ever get to see. When they get to the bar area, the only booze that's left is Peach Schnapps, and it's here where Beth breaks down. Not because of the schnapps, but she's finally taken a moment to rest and reflect on what's happened, in an environment where it's safe to cry as loud as you want. Daryl feels her pain and understands why she needs a drink now. I ain't gonna have your first drink. Be no damn Peach Schnapps. Daryl's idea of a real drink is some moonshine that he finds in this house that looks like it was probably just as run down before the zombie apocalypse. And after a drinking game gets too personal, he too has an emotional breakdown, finally being honest about the guilt he feels in not being able to protect the prison and all the people who perished in the conflict. And your dad? Maybe, maybe I could have done something. This is a key moment of connection for these two, and they have a deep conversation throughout the night before deciding that they should be leaving the past in the past with a symbolic burning of the rundown house. The episode was better on second watch, but bear in mind when I first saw this, we had to wait a week in between episodes. So you can imagine being excited after having waited all week, and then when your new Walking Dead episode comes out, nothing really happens in it. The opening is just a visual representation of how the group found Bob, something we already learned about from their conversations and didn't really need to see it. The episode too largely feels like a waste of time, in my opinion of course. Maggie runs off from the group, then Bob splits away from Sasha and they all get back together to carry on their way to Terminus. I know that sounds like an exaggeration, but that pretty much is all that happens with this group. The saving grace for this episode is definitely Daryl and Beth taking shelter in a funeral home. They really feel like they've become family at this point, and it makes me laugh when Beth says this. Just go ahead and play some more. Keep singing. I thought my singing annoyed you. See? See? I'm not the only one who doesn't like her singing. This scene of her singing, however, doesn't trigger me at all, because in this particular case, she was invited to sing by Daryl, so she didn't just start singing randomly without any consideration for if others wanted to hear it. It's the difference between you clicking on my video and me turning up to your door unannounced and talking to you about movies and TV series for an hour. Unfortunately, they get pushed out of the funeral home by walkers, but when Daryl goes to find Beth, her stuff is on the ground and a mysterious car speeds away. He chases her until the morning light, then a group of biker type fellows happen upon him. Naturally, he reacts to them as hostiles, but the main guy seems kinda chill, so maybe he'll become friends with them. The episode ends with another person looking at the Terminus sign, this time it's Glenn. Oh boy, this episode is heavy stuff. The opening is Lizzie playing outside, but she's not playing hopscotch or bloody knuckles like a normal kid. She's playing tag with a walker. Lizzie still gets deeply upset whenever a walker gets killed, and this is the episode that pushed me to research if her character has a mental condition, but there are no reliable sources slapping a label on her, which is fine. I just had to make sure I wasn't mocking a character with a specific mental illness. Why are you crying? I don't want to say. 
You do feel bad for her, but trust me, in this episode, she's way too much. When Carol spots her playing tag with a walker, Lizzie starts screaming at her about it. You could have died! It's the same day you killed her! You killed her! It's the same day! What if I killed you? What if I killed you? Of course, it's interesting that we have such a range of different people in this show, who are each handling the end of the world in different ways. And factoring in how a neuroatypical person might handle the situation gives the show a level of realism, but I think because there's a lack of clarity on what her condition is, it can be frustrating to watch her and not understand her motivations. I hope this doesn't come across insensitive, I just find her character to be a bizarre experience, and it appears there are other people who agree with this, whether that's fair or not. That evening, while discussing the importance of doing the right thing, Lizzie takes the wrong message away from the conversation and decides to kill her sister in order to let her turn, just so that she can prove them wrong about walkers not being people. No, no, no! We have to wait. I need to show you, you'll see, you'll finally get it. We have to wait. We can wait. You just give me the gun. You and Tyree should take Judith back. It's not safe for her. Yeah, this scene's pretty messed up. I like how Carol keeps her composure to remove the danger from the situation before then breaking down when Lizzie is out of sight. Carol knows the only way forward is for Lizzie to be put down, as she clearly cannot mentally cope with this world and has now become a danger to others. I love you, Lizzie. <laughs> just, just look at the flowers. I have to stress that despite my disliking towards her character, this scene was extremely sad. I might be an a-hole, but I'm not a monster. Okay, technically speaking, I am a monster, but I do have a heart. I have three of them. Before they leave the house, Carol admits to Tyrese that she was the one who killed Karen and offers him a chance to enact his revenge. A really cool moment seeing Carol do the right thing and bravely putting her neck on the line. But Tyrese being an absolute champ forgives her, seeing that she's a good hearted person who was just trying to protect people. And maybe this is less interesting than the fireworks we were expecting to see, but this is fine. I realise I haven't yet shown you how Eugene talks. Looking at the fossil record, knowing what I know about this infection, you cannot say for certain it isn't what killed off the dinosaurs. And do I believe that's what happened? No. But it's enjoyable as hell to think about an undead ankylosaur going after a diplodocus. That there's a video game worth the pre-order. It's a fun novelty at first, but after a while his voice gets kind of grating. As they walk along the tracks, they find one of Maggie's messages she left for Glenn, telling him to go to Terminus. So he starts hauling ass down the track, fueled by the power of love. Daryl isn't getting along too well with the other bowmen of this new group, and they start bickering over a cottontail rabbit they killed. This group works on a claimed system, where if you yell the word claimed at something you've just found, it automatically becomes yours. It's at this point I realised their leader, Joe, is the same guy who was sitting on the porch of the house Rick snuck out of, and that's why that episode was called Claimed. Joe settles the dispute by splitting the rabbit in half and giving his guy the more favourable end, apparently. The ass end is still an end. See, I would have thought the ass end is better, because the ass end has more meat. <coughs> On their next stop, Daryl wakes up to accusations of stealing the other end of the rabbit, but Joe saw the accuser sneaking it into Daryl's sack, and this group have strict rules on lying, so they beat him to death and leave him lying in the ditch outside. Glenn's group come to a long tunnel on the tracks, and as Abraham rightly points out, it would be foolish to go through when they can hear walkers somewhere in the darkness. Glenn isn't deterred by this tunnel, but Abraham's on his mission to keep Eugene alive, so they part ways. We get this really funny moment of Eugene trying his luck. I have to say that you were seriously hot, Tara. Yeah, I like girls. Well, you miss every shot you don't take, I suppose. Glenn and Tara find a pile of rocks obstructing the way, with walkers buried within. And over the top of this obstruction is a seemingly impossible amount of walkers to get through. But then Glenn comes up with the idea to position his torch on the other side of the rocks, which distracts the walkers as they climb down. But then Tara gets her leg trapped under a boulder, which is far too heavy for Glenn to shift. They're, they're coming. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. And just as all hope looks lost, a car pulls up and saves them. (laughs) 
Finally, our first group arrives at Terminus, a seemingly welcoming place with friendly but cautious signs, fresh flowers outside, and a woman cooking strange looking meat. I'm Mary. <sighs> Looks like you've been on the road a while. Well, let's get you settled and we'll make you a plate. Welcome to Terminus. This is a really crap season finale. They pad out what feels like half the runtime with flashbacks, seeing Herschel talking with Rick at the farm, where they have very low stakes, friendly conversations. In other words, kind of meaningless conversations. It's at this point in the show where you really feel them starting to stretch out the story, just so they can hit that 16 episode quota. In my opinion, there's been enough valueless time that we could have cut it back by two episodes, and it would have made the experience more enjoyable. This might go on a while. Maybe we can speed this up. That's not to say it's been all bad, but I'm really starting to feel that stretch. Rick, Michonne and Carl are making steady progress to Terminus. They find a car to sleep in overnight, but then Joe shows up holding a gun to Rick, as one guy from his group remembers Rick's face from the claimed episode. I wasn't going to mention it, but as Rick was hiding under the bed, two guys had a fight over who gets to sleep on it, and I thought this guy who was being choked out on the floor was dead. But as we can see him now, it turns out he was just passed out. The creepiest looking guy in the gang eyes up Carl and begins trying to assault him at knife point. Daryl steps out from the shadows and pleads the case that this group are good people, but Joe isn't willing to accept this because of what Rick did to the toilet guy. Luckily, Rick finds an opportunity to headbutt him and they manage to pull off a counter attack on Joe's gang. Rick seeing red guts the fat guy like the pig he is. It's very gory, but it's very justified. Before they enter Terminus, Rick buries a bag of guns outside of the perimeter fence, which is a super smart move. They go through the back doors, making sure they have the upper hand in case they're held up upon entry. But the people here seem pretty friendly for now. You're nervous, I get it. We were all the same way. We came here for sanctuary. Is that what you're here for? Yes. Good. You found it. As they go to grab some lunch together, Rick spots someone wearing Maggie's poncho and another with Herschel's watch, suggesting that they mugged or killed Maggie and Glenn. Where the hell did you get this watch? Some rooftop gunmen order them to drop their weapons, and then when they try to escape Terminus, the gunmen shoot at their feet in order to direct them into the place they want them to go. Anyone with half a brain would realise what the Terminus gunmen are trying to do here, and you would try to outsmart them by not going down the path that they're obviously trying to get you to go down. But apparently Rick and Kyle are easily herded like sheep. And to think I praised your intelligence mere moments ago, Rick. So the sheep wind up surrounded by guns, where they're ordered to go inside this train car labelled A. And that's why the episode is called A. Isn't that clever? Everybody's so creative. Inside the car, they see Glenn, Maggie and the others are still alive. And the ending dialogue is so anticlimactic, but they edit it in a way that's supposed to make it seem cool. I've had to trim this down for copyright reasons, but still, check this out and tell me you weren't expecting him to say something a little more cool. They're gonna feel pretty stupid when they find out. Find out what? To screw in with the wrong people. What a lame way to end the season. The start of the episode reveals that the guys currently running Terminus faced a situation where some raiders kept them captive, just like they're doing to Rick's gang now. Their conversations suggest that they used to be good people who were at one point genuinely offering sanctuary, but over time, I guess they got corrupted. We were trying to do something good. We were being human beings. What are we now, Gareth? <laughs> it's an interesting story, so let's see what they do with this as we flash forward to the present. As the gang prepare to defend themselves, a hatch opens on the roof and they get dizzied by a smoke grenade. Move! 
They then lined up kneeling at a pig trough and when looking around we can see they're in the slaughterhouse. To the right of Rick we see Dippy again. So he does return to the story. Oh, never mind. Of course, as they make their way down the line, they stop before they kill anyone we care about. Bob urges for them to believe that Eugene can cure the Walker disease, making this slaughter activity unnecessary. We can put the world back to how it was. Can't go back, Bob. Terminus Tommy, his real name doesn't matter, orders the executions to proceed, but as they're about to swing the bat, something explodes. Going back slightly, Carol and Tyrese are hiding from a walker herd when they get redirected by the gunfire from Terminus. And nearby, they spot a Terminus randomer talking about Rick's gang. So Carol puts a gun to his head. Listen, y'all don't have to do this. Whatever you want, we got a place where everyone's welcome. Shut up, man. Okay. We're friends with the chick with the sword and the kid in the hat. We look and we saw him step in on the mat. We look and we saw him, the cat in the hat, and he said... We're friends with the chick with the sword and the kid in the hat. Carol then covers herself in walker gut so that she can blend in with the crowd and get close to Terminus undetected. Then she shoots a hole in a propane tank and sets off a firework to ignite the gas. Okay, that was pretty satisfying. And she looks like a total badass when she walks into the destruction. Notice how I'm trying to correctly say badass, which goes against my Essexness, but I'm trying my best to make sure I say this word correctly after the mean comments left on my Breaking Bad video. How did this geeky looking dad in his saggy underpants become the biggest badass TV hero ever? Even goofier than my accent is this guy who's wiggling around on the floor instead of getting up and running away from the walkers. His face then gets eaten in a really cheap looking way, which is a real contrast to the awesome pyrotechnics we have going on here. I'm assuming the fire on these walkers is real and not digital. Either way, it looks fantastic. Rick manages to cut through his binds and surprise attacks the butchers. Before Carol reunites with the gang, she gets spotted by Terminus leader Mary. I want to see your face. But they quickly skip the verbal foreplay and go into full battle, with Carol eventually gaining the upper hand. At this point, Mary explains how this place used to be an actual sanctuary. Yeah, we already heard this before. But to be fair, she does go into some gruesome details about what the captors did to them, which corrupted their worldview from that point on. Carol then demands to know where Rick and the others are, and she ain't messing around. <laughs> Damn, Carol's awesome in this episode. When Carol's done talking with her, she opens the door and allows the walkers to come finish the job. No, no! Ah! Back to Tyrese, he's keeping an eye on their Terminus prisoner until he gets distracted by the Terminus explosion. So the prisoner threatens to snap Judith's neck and orders him to go outside. Oh man, you know the prisoner's not going to go through with it, but it's still stressful to watch. So let's skip to the predictable part where Tyrese tackles him down to the ground and no baby dies. Still trapped inside the train car, Eugene's getting pressured to reveal the classified information on how to cure this disease. The others giving a good justification that someone else should know how to do it, just in case Eugene gets killed on the way to Washington. His explanation is basically that there exists a government controlled virus that can wipe out the entire population of Earth. Why would something like this exist? Who knows? But then he explains that they can flip the script and kill every walker instead. Well, anyway, they get rescued and then all the gang get back together, which means that this is the moment where Rick and Carl realise that baby Judith's still alive. It's a really sweet moment. This seven minute long cold opening is almost a complete waste of time, filled with pointless slow-mo shots of them just walking. <laughs> wow, so cool and interesting. We simply have to film this part in slow motion. The end is at least a little intriguing, as Daryl thinks he spots someone stalking them in the woods. Naturally, they include the Tara fist bump moment, just to personally attack my soul. Despite my bitching, the actual episode is pretty decent. They come across a vicar in distress, who somehow marooned himself onto a tiny rock, surrounded by walkers. You okay? Yes, thank you. His name is Gabriel, and he claims that he's never killed any person or walker in the entire time that he's survived. 
To prove how he survived, he takes them back to his church, where he shows them the massive food supply he had, left over from a donation before the world ended. Then they force him to lead them to the nearby sorting centre for the church donations. And this scene of the group wading around in the water and taking out walkers is kind of cool. With a fun looking walker dummy that Bob gets attacked by. For some reason, one walker's blood is purple, which makes no sense at all. Was it a mistake? All the other walkers here have your typical blood and putrid ooze colours. When they arrive back, Carl notices that someone has etched an angry message about Gabriel on the outside of the church. And that night, Rick makes it clear that he doesn't care what Gabriel did, but he will unleash hell if he tries anything with his group. Ah, come on, I want to know what he did. Before this fair warning, Abraham raised a toast in recognition of the amazing survival skills of this group. And then he urged everyone to consider doing more than just surviving by helping him get Eugene to Washington as soon as they can. An idea of which everyone gets super pumped for. Still yeah. This episode also establishes that Bob and Sasha are now an item. And I've got to be honest, I am not feeling it. At first I thought maybe Sasha and Tyrese would be good together, but then I learned they're brother and sister. <laughs> And I genuinely didn't know that until writing this review. Even though I don't feel their connection, it looks like it's not going to matter anyway, because Bob gets kidnapped that evening while standing outside. And then he wakes up to find these survivors from Terminus have chopped off his leg, cooked it, and now they're eating it. If it makes you feel any better, you taste much better than we thought you would. One of the other interesting developments is Carol and Daryl spotting the car that took Beth. So they hop in their car in hot pursuit. Terminus Tommy's delivering extensive dialogue about the necessity of eating humans and blah blah blah. It goes on for way too long in my opinion, but it has a good payoff where Bob reveals that he was bitten, which happened in that scuffle underwater. And it's here that we get Bob's iconic line. I've been bitten, you stupid prats! <laughs> I'm tainting meat. <laughs> How's it gonna happen? We're gonna turn, we're just gonna die? Albert, calm the hell down. We cooked him. Everything is gonna be fine. Tainting me! Shut up. <laughs> you eating tainted me? Said, Shut up! We cut to Gabriel being forced to confess what he did to make someone scratch the words subscribe to Hausenberg on his church. Who typed this silly gag into the script? You know what it actually says. Turns out Gabriel was just super scared when everything fell apart and locked himself in the church while people were dying outside. And although what he did was super horrible, you do feel bad for the guy as he admits that he's a flawed human being for being so cowardly and doing the only thing he knows how to do to survive. I always lock the doors. I always lock the doors. <laughs> The gang hear someone whistling outside and find that Bob has been left on their doorstep, keeping him alive as an intimidation tactic, I guess. Bob reveals to the group that he's been bit, and Abraham's like, I am a head out, because that right there is a danger to Eugene. This causes Rick to go at loggerheads with him, saying, No, we can't leave without Carol and Daryl. And then Abraham says, You can't tell me what to do, etc., etc. Glenn steps up and helps them to reach an agreement to wait half a day longer. Half a day. Come high noon with tail lights. Now waiting for the other damn shoe to drop. And we will leave with you. Later that same night, the Terminus guys are back looking for trouble. But upon entering the church, everyone's hidden away. And then Rick, in his shadow assassin form, fires bullets from the darkness. Put your guns on the floor. Rick will fire right into that office, so you lower your gun. Put your guns on the floor and kneel. Do what he says. Honestly, it's satisfying to see Rick on the winning side for a change, instead of losing people again in the conflict. And we even have Terminus Tommy actually bargaining for his life. You don't have to do this. We can walk away and we will never cross paths again. I promise you. No! It sucks for Gabriel though, seeing him watch a place that he held as sacred grounds, being tainted by the sin of murder. This is the Lord's house. No. Just four walls and a roof. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! The next day, Bob dies after a lengthy goodbye with everyone. I'm still not buying the relationship with Sasha, and I can't pinpoint exactly why I feel this way, but I do know that Bob's passing didn't hit me all that hard. 
Carol and Daryl still haven't returned, so Abraham prepares the bus to head to Washington, with Maggie and Glenn joining them. So for now, we have the group split up on two different journeys. At the end of the episode, Daryl comes back, but Carol doesn't. Where's Carol? Beth wakes up in the hospital and it's here that I'm reminded that we're back in the city of Atlanta and this realisation kind of brings about a feeling of boredom. It seems crazy to me that we've had quite a few locations in this show and yet for whatever reason the show feels compelled to bring us back to Atlanta. I just think at this point in the show it would have been nice to change up the location just for the sake of a change of scenery for the audience. Naturally, Beth is like, yo, what the F? Why am I here and where is Daryl? But the bitchy police officer is more concerned with reminding Beth that she owes them big time for saving her life. And trust me when I use the word bitchy, because this woman turns into a right can't say that word on YouTube. The doctor shows her around a bit, purely to make sure that it's explained to her that the elevator shaft is the quickest way to the ground floor. Use everything you can use. Yeah. Plus, it's the fastest way now. <laughs> It was very important that she was told this for when she tries to escape later. I, I mean to help with the bodies. Yeah, that's it. The dialogue is such obvious foreshadowing, but I would allow it this time because I think this method of body disposal is a pretty good idea. Police officer Gorman starts giving off creepy vibes by telling Beth that everything has a cost and she's going to need to earn her keep somehow. Yeah, this foreshadowing is equally as obvious. Later, the doctor fails to save a patient and in response, Officer Dawn slaps Beth. It's so weird. Why choose to save someone's life and then immediately decide you resent them, even though Beth hasn't done anything wrong yet? Sure, she doesn't appear to be all that grateful yet, but she's in an understandable state of confusion. Dawn tries offering a justification, kind of, as to why she needs to be such a demanding bitch, but it doesn't really answer why she's been so rough with Beth in particular. I know you didn't ask for this. I didn't either. I didn't either. A woman gets brought in for an emergency amputation and she refuses local anaesthetic because she hates that creepy cop or something. Smart whore. And they demand that Beth helps out by holding the patient still. Yes, you, small framed teenage girl. We need your strength to hold down this woman as we cut off her arm. Beth then visits the clothes cupboard to get some fresh scrubs. And here we meet Noah. Old people watching this will remember him as Chris from Everybody Hates Chris. He's quite a likeable down to earth character in this, who is openly aware of this place being a bit strange. And he connects with Beth in their joint desire to get out as soon as possible. Creepy Officer Gorman giving her more incentive to get out by sucking on a lollipop he confiscated from her room. I don't want it. Oh, come on now. I just want to be sure I'm returning this to its rightful owner. Ugh. The doctor asks Beth to give 75 milligrams of clozapine to a patient, and as soon as she administers this, he starts seizing out. Officer Dawn demands to know what happened, and Beth gets tangled in a web of lies, with Noah opting to take the blame, saying that he tripped out the ventilator, and the doctor claims that he told her to administer clonazepam, for the benefit of those who haven't seen the show yet. He's stable due for another 75 milligrams of clozapine. Well, you, you gave him clonazepam, right? Clos... clozapine. You said clozapine? No, I didn't. You're a liar! You're a liar! Beth and Noah form a plan to escape, where Beth needs to first sneak into an office and get some keys. Gorman catches her in the act and takes the opportunity to try and take advantage of her. Luckily, however, the woman patient from earlier was lying dead on the floor as she took herself out, and she reanimated into a walker to get her revenge from beyond the grave. They both escape so far as the front gates, where Noah makes it through, but Beth gets tackled to the ground, and before she knows it, she's back in the hospital, getting yet another slap. <laughs> Beth holds a shiv, ready to poke holes in her captors, but then she sees Carol being carted in unconscious. Abraham's party bus are having a great time, feeling excited for their trip to DC, but then the engine gives out, causing the bus to swerve, and they get flipped upside down. Everyone's fine, of course, but we see just how cowardly Eugene is here when he can barely muster the courage to take out one walker by himself. I know it sucks and it's scary, but it's time to be brave. It is involuntary. It is when you're screwed either way. So you got through the choice that might help somebody. The bus is done for, and Eugene advises that they go back to the previous town, but Abraham is tenacious in his command to carry on the mission. Now we will get through this because we have to. Every direction is a question. We don't go back! 
I like that Abraham lets his guard down here, to be honest with Glenn. Listen, I took a pretty hard shot to the sack with that crash. I am stressed and depressed to see that ride die, but if you say we're rolling on, I'm good. That night, while taking shelter in the library, Rosita and Abraham are doing sweaty cuddle stuff, and Eugene gets caught by Tara watching them. Interestingly, he explains it as an unspoken agreement they have, where they can mutually get off on the voyeur act, as a harmless vice to cope with the end times. As he talks to Tara, he lets slip that he's the reason the bus's engine blew up, stating that he's afraid of the consequences if he can't cure the disease. It's not how it works. I don't fix things. There's no way you people would keep me around share resources, even protect me. Of course we would. We're friends. But the deceit goes a bit deeper than this, as we're about to find out. They find this fire truck and set off on their journey again. But yet again, they encounter an obstacle. This time, it's a massive walker herd in the road. Abraham feels pushed to his limit when the group once again suggests a detour. And as Abraham grabs Eugene to march him back to the fire truck, Eugene confesses the truth. I lied. I'm not a scientist. I don't know how to stop it. This is my favourite twist in the series so far. I remember not expecting this at all, and it's still fun to watch again now. The way Abraham looks so lost and hurt with this information speaks to the talent of Michael Cudlitz's acting. Josh McDermott too, who plays Eugene. I know I ripped into his character's voice, but this example of acting was a peak Eugene moment. I know I'm smarter than most people. I know I'm a very good liar, and I know I needed to get to DC. Why? Because I do believe that locale holds the strongest possibility for survival, and I wanted to survive. Eugene then foolishly decides to explain how much smarter he is, and that's why he's able to survive. Hey, 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 come on! Get off of him! <laughs> Woohoo! That was a brutal knockout, holy hell. As Abraham falls to his knees, giving up hope, we get a flashback to show the time when Eugene first lied to him. You can't leave. Why? I have a very important mission. Even though it's information we already knew, it just helps drive home how devastating the deception is for Abraham. The opening shows us Carol's perspective from when she was first outcast from the prison, then seeing her crying from the heartbreak of splitting, then seeing her unhappy as she travels alone, and then finally ending with her finding that the prison's been destroyed. Kind of a weird time in the series to show this, as in my mind we've kind of moved past this already, but it was interesting to see I guess. This episode entirely focuses on Carol and Daryl as they follow the strange car back to Atlanta, and aside from a few notable moments there's not much interesting to talk about. Not necessarily a bad episode, as it strengthens the relationship between Carol and Daryl, but I'm more focused on recapping the plot driving moments. One moment of interest is when they come across this meeting room with frosted glass and see what we presume to be a mother and child turn walker. Daryl tells Carol to walk away, appreciating the fact that she's still in pain from losing Sophia. And the next morning while she was sleeping, he disposes of the bodies in a dignified way, a completely unnecessary act that is actually kind of stupid in that he's just created a massive plume of smoke that runs a high risk of drawing attention to their location. But on a positive note, he's just done a super nice thing for Carol here. The next noteworthy event is they investigate a van brandished with the same logo of the car they were chasing, and they discover that it came from a nearby hospital. But by the time this information is found, they're surrounded by walkers and decide to lock themselves in. <laughs> This walker crowd is so small, I'm certain they could have made it through. They've dealt with way bigger walker crowds in the past and managed to survive. But of course, that's not as exciting as watching them buckle up while the van is pushed off the bridge, and then listening to the walkers falling and hitting the van. It's all good fun. The last part of the story to mention is that they run into Noah, who is understandably hostile towards them, but after they save his life from a walker, he reveals information on the hospital and that the blonde girl they're looking for is alive and well and being held captive there. As they leave the building, Carol gets hit by one of their cars and gets taken in. Noah correctly advises Daryl not to try and rescue her because they're going to give her the medical attention she now needs. Rick and the gang are dismantling the church to add protection to the outside. And again, your heart breaks a little for Gabriel. Are you going to take the cross too? If we need it. 
They band together and hit the road to rescue Carol and Beth. Beth right now trying her best to keep it under wraps that she knows Carol. Abraham remains on his knees for a painful amount of time, and he isn't willing to listen to a reason right now to carry on. He squares up to Rosita when she gets sassy with him, and Maggie shuts him down before his temper flares again. She does eventually take pity on him, and convinces him to drink some water so he can carry on living. They very generously cover Eugene, to stop him becoming a baked potato from the Georgia sunshine, and because of their kindness, he regains consciousness by the end. When Rick's group arrive in the city, they execute their plan where they draw out the hospital police and take them captive until they agree to help the group infiltrate the building. One of the cops cleverly appeals to Sasha's compassionate nature, and they get friendly enough where she lets her guard down, and he smashes her head into the window and makes his escape. Rick chases after the cop who injured Sasha, and when he refuses to stop running, Rick full sends the cop car, breaking his back as he hits the road. Maybe he didn't mean to hurt him this bad, but it's too late for apologies, so he mercy kills him. Not gonna lie to you, I kinda wanted to see this guy getting eaten by walkers instead. Gabriel accidentally leads a herd of walkers back to the church, and with Michonne and Carl's help, they deal with the problem by locking them all inside, which of course now means they've lost yet another campsite. Fire Engine gang come back and tell Michonne the bad news that Eugene is a liar, and Maggie gets the good news that Beth is still alive. Oh, this is gonna get awkward. The two remaining cops tell Rick's group that they don't like Dawn, and they're willing to lie in order to get a hostage swap deal on the cards. I like this moment where Rick meets with two other officers so they can set the agreement terms. We want to make an exchange. Then we'll be on our way. No one gets hurt. Where are your people? They're close. Rick's been in a really strong position of authority these past few episodes. He feels untouchable at the moment, and it's really satisfying to watch. In the hospital, they make the exchange. Two officers for Beth and Carol, but Dawn's ego won't allow Noah to walk away with them, and she demands that he stays. Beth stands up for Noah, and also takes this opportunity to try and shut Dawn up for good. But this happens. <laughs> This gunfire felt very instinctual, and the way her face immediately changes signals to us that this was a mistake, and that she had no intention of it ending like this. But before she can argue her case... I'm glad this part wasn't prolonged, because this series typically loves a prolonged death scene. Real shame about Beth, she was never the strongest character for me, but she instilled a sense of responsibility in those who protected her. And the look on Daryl's face as he carries her body out almost brought me to tears. And that's what I find most upsetting about her death. She was basically the little sister of the group, and everyone cared for her, including her sister Maggie, who now has no family left. And isn't that just awful? <laughs> Boy, this episode stinks. The title alone is humorously lackluster. What happened and what's going on? Paired with a confused looking Michonne on the thumbnail. <laughs> the cold open tries to go for something stylistic, and while it's great to see a cold open be a little experimental, it feels like a student's first attempt at an art house film. It comes across like it's trying to be all deep and meaningful, but in execution, it just comes across cheesy. Don't cry for me, I'm already dead. So, let's talk about the episode. Noah guides some of the gang back to his neighbourhood in the hopes that they're still alive, but nah, they're all dead, and he's understandably not too happy about it. Tyrese and Noah go to his old house, while the others search the rest of the houses for supplies. Noah mourns over this body, who are presumed to be his mum. Tyrese is in the other room looking at pictures of Noah and his dead brother, and while he's distracted, he gets bit by a walker kid. <laughs> Noah comes in and helps him get rid of the walker kid, and then says he's going to run and get help. And I kid you not, the time between Noah leaving the house and him getting the attention of the others for help is seven and a half minutes. <laughs> We're made to wait seven and a half minutes to find out if a character everyone likes is going to get the help he needs before it's too late. And by the seven minute mark, everyone watching will likely have the feeling that it is too late, because amputation needs to be an immediate action. 
While Tyrese waits for help, he starts hallucinating dead characters. And it was cool to see some of these characters again, but not when they're a part of another prolonged death scene. And this one really does drag out for way too long. They try to rush Tyrese back home, but they stop the car when he dies en route, and the episode ends with his funeral. So yeah, rip Tyrese. I wish your death was handled differently, but we move on. Another episode where almost nothing interesting happens. The gang are still on the road, but now they're feeling the effects of the dry season. Everyone's thirsty and everyone's starving. There were a couple of okay moments, like they get approached by some hungry dogs, but Sasha kills them. And so they have some tasty dog for dinner. Then there's a scene where they're camping out for the night in a barn, taking shelter from a heavy thunderstorm. And then they have to hold the fort as a bunch of walkers push against the barn doors. This kind of editing gives me a real headache, rather than giving me the intended feeling of suspense. For comparison's sakes, the thunderstorm walker scene in season 4 episode 12 did so much better with this goal. Along the road, they find someone's left them water, with a note saying that it's a gift from a friend. Eugene steps forward to be the guinea pig and test the water, but interestingly, Abraham stops him, so it looks like he's starting to forgive him. At the end of the episode, this mystery friend emerges from the bushes. My name is Aaron. I know. It's stranger danger, but um, I'm a friend. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Aaron enters the barn, and everyone immediately assumes the worst and treats him like a potential threat. After all this group has been through, you do understand, but at the same time, you feel bad for this guy, as he's trying his hardest to convince them that he's a good guy, who simply just wants to help. He even brings baby food that Rick forces him to eat first to make sure it's not poison. I hate applesauce. My mom used to make me eat foods I didn't like to make me more manly. Again, totally justifiable. Even as an audience member, we've become so accustomed to people turning out to be villains that it's hard to 100% trust him. Michonne, Glenn and some others travel to a spot where Aaron says he has some cars with food inside. And I like that on the way, Michonne reminds Glenn that they've had to place their trust in many strangers before, herself included. Hell, go back far enough in the story and they were all strangers once. Aaron tells them about his community, and even has pictures to prove how safe it is. But Rick isn't quite convinced. Michonne goes against Rick's decision, and says they have to give this community a chance, as everyone's on their last legs from exhaustion. This is a key moment where I feel Michonne becomes a voice of leadership for the group, and for me it marks the point in the show where I can gladly say that Michonne is now a top tier character. Rick agrees to the decision, but refuses to take the route that Aaron recommends, opting for a different road, so that he can bypass any traps that Aaron may have set. Aaron warns him that the other roads are dangerous, and well, he was right. This road is full of walkers, and the car gets jammed up after mowing many of them down. I love how bloody this car gets, it's super gross. Now the car won't start, and then Aaron freaks out when he sees a flare go off in the distance. He kicks his way out of the car and runs off into the woods. While looking for him, Rick fires a flare into the eye socket of some walkers, and it's a great visual. They get to a halfway point where Aaron's boyfriend is waiting for them. He was helping keep watch on the group's movement, and somehow managed to bust up his foot on the way back. They make their way over to Aaron's community called Alexandria, and on the way they spot Washington DC in the distance. And I know the mission has now changed, but personally I'd still like to see them go there. I can't remember if this happens later in the series, but I'll remain optimistic. They get to Alexandria, and Rick practically tears up when he hears children playing inside the fences. A sense of relief washes over the group, and we'll see what this place turns out to be in the next episode. Rick and the others are interviewed while being recorded by Deanna, the governor of Alexandria. I'm sure she's going to be less unhinged than the previous governor, as everything about this community seems nice and well-functioning. They have electricity, hot water, a hairstylist, a girl for Carl to fall in love with probably, and all with zero heads floating in tanks. They all decide to sleep in the same house that night, even though they've been given their own houses, doing so out of caution not to let their guard down 100%. When Carl is invited to play video games and do normal teenager stuff, you can see it in his face how close he is to breaking down. But that's only because they gave him the off-brand Xbox controller, the one that the guest always has to use. 
They tell them about a walker they've hung from the trees to practice stabbing or something. But the walker's got away and so they whistle for it to come back and it almost gets to Tara before Glenn takes it out. This move upsetting them greatly. You almost got her killed. I told you all to stay back. I told you to listen to every damn thing I said. I told you that. The lead guy squares up to Glenn for not following his orders, and to see Glenn hold his ground without flinching reminds me of how far he's come since his baseball cap wearing, never seen boobs before, hey dumbass days. Deanna jumps in and orders cocky guy to treat Glenn and the other community noobs as equals so long as they live here. That night, Rick and the other leaders of the gang agree that they're going to remain strong in case this community fails to keep them safe. Sasha sets up some pictures to practice her aim, but isn't she a bit close? She's using a scoped rifle, which is almost impossible to miss with at this range, right? Now I've said it before, I'm no gun guy, so I could be chatting shit here, but I feel strongly that I'm right on this. Main reason for showing this scene is because Sasha is exhibiting signs of PTSD. <laughs> While out having a conversation, Daryl notices that a walker has the letter W carved in its head. And I was wondering when the gang were going to notice this, after we saw the first walker with this symbol carved in its head in that crappy episode where Tyrese dies. I guess because they were in a rush, they didn't notice that walker. I can't remember when we find out the meaning behind this symbol, but I feel like it's going to be soon. Carol's really interesting in this episode. She pretends to be all sweet and innocent in front of this community so that she doesn't stand out as a threat. But then later when she's caught taking guns out of the stash by this kid, her dark side comes out to threaten him. You can never tell anyone, especially your mom. Because if you do, one morning you wake up and you won't be in your bed. Where will I be? You'll be outside the walls. Daryl was helping Aaron to try and rein this horse, but it keeps running away from the walkers, until it eventually fails to do so and gets ripped apart. Not really a significant event, but the horse was featured in the thumbnail, so I felt like I should mention it. That evening, Deanna hosts a welcoming party, and it's almost alien to see them all dressed up and looking nice. Rick looking like a lot of guy goals right now. He's got the tidy look going with a slight rough quality that women love, or so I'm told. Seems to be winning over the hairstylist, Jessie. She and Rick keep giving each other boink me eyes in front of a seemingly oblivious husband. Rick even goes as far as to give her a proper cheek kiss later. Everyone is slowly settling into this new way of life, but Sasha's PTSD hits hard and she snaps at the others for having it so easy. Just worried that I'll end up cooking something you hate. <laughs> You're worried? That's what you worry about? The episode ends with Rick being in patrol as a sheriff again, exchanging let's pork somewhere private signals with Jesse. Gabriel has set up a makeshift church, and when he sees he's been gifted some strawberries, he starts tearing apart his Bible. Later on, we get clued in as to why he's acting like this, but for now, it's clear that he doesn't feel deserving of this fresh start. Noah asks for some coaching on how to build things, to be taught by this nice guy architect fella, and he advises Noah that there's no need for that particular skill in this community, as he has that covered. But what he could do instead is start documenting a history of Alexandria, and he should start today. It feels like a father and son connection could form between them, and as both of these guys are likeable, chill characters, you kinda want it for them. Eugene is forced into going to a nearby electronics place to get parts for a solar panel, and once again he argues that his lack of experience with a gun means he's much more useful staying at home. God, you really that much of a coward? Yes, I am. I told you I was. Yeah, fair point. Inside the warehouse, Aiden starts shooting at a fully geared army walker, and yet despite the fact that Aiden was with the army reserves, Glenn has to be the one to tell him not to shoot bullets at a man with grenades strapped to his body. Aiden's impaled on a bracket, and Tara's knocked out. Aiden's not dead, however, and Eugene promises them that he will look after Tara while they go help him out. They try and lift Aiden off the shelf, but he's jammed on the metalwork good and proper, so they have no choice but to let him get torn apart. <laughs> Eugene spots an exit and puts Tara on his shoulders to make his first heroic move in the show. Wait! 
we have one more casualty to witness before they go home. Noah, Glenn and this guy get stuck in a revolving door and the rando guy keeps pushing the door to try and save his own skin. This selfish act getting Noah's arm in reach of the hungry walkers and as he's pushed up against the glass he's brutally pulled apart. <laughs> I liked Noah. He didn't have too many standout moments in the show, but his chilled temperament made him the everyman type character that's very easy to relate to. It's not so much sad that he died, it's sad because the show could have kept him for a while longer to do more interesting things with his character. Back home, Carol suspects that the young boy is victim to a violent dad who happens to be the husband of the hot hairdresser. What was her name again? Oh yeah, Jessie. I did write this joke into the script, but at the time of writing this I did genuinely forget her name. Carol tells Rick about this and says they have to kill him before the beating gets worse. But couldn't you just get the governor involved so that she can kick him out or something? It seems a bit extreme to just kill him straight away. Maggie overhears Gabriel talking to Deanna and basically talking smack about the group, saying that he's the good guy who deserves to be here, but Rick and the others are bad apples. They're all vicious murderers and such. They can't be trusted. They're dangerous. Wow, what a snake. Deanna plays her son Aiden's music CD as she mourns his death and the song plays throughout the cold opening and my god what a jarring experience. It's a 9 inch now song which I hadn't heard before and I played it independently of the episode and found that I hated it much less but this song being used for the intro was just a really bad choice. It really did not fit the tone at all. A depressing grunge song does not match the vibe of Carol cooking. We see the early signs of Deanna losing trust in the new guys, with her walking away from a grieving gift that Carol baked. Outside of the walls, Aaron and Daryl spot a light coming from a distant house, so at least the end of this cold opening is interesting. Deanna's reviewing interview tapes, comparing Glenn's story to this guy's story about how Aiden and Noah lost their lives, with random guy telling lies in order to distract from the shameful way he acted. They did this. It was them. But you all came back together. How did that happen? While on patrol, Rick stands by a lake thinking about what Carol said to him regarding Jesse's husband. And who should happen to walk by but the man himself? You okay, man? Keep walking. What? What are you... Instead of killing him, he decides to raise the issue with Deanna. Yes, that's a good boy. You did well with that decision. And the second he infers that violence will be involved, Deanna's level of unease around Rick rises again. And although Gabriel was a massive douche for steering her mindset, Rick's view on the world is vastly different to Deanna's due to his experiences. So I think this disagreement was bound to happen. In the woods, Sasha's given an emotional speech to let out some pent up feelings. Now that Noah has died too, at least I think that's what was being said, I was mostly distracted by the straw stuck in her hair and was just waiting for it to come loose or for someone to pick it out. <laughs> so yeah, if you ever pour your heart out to me, maybe check you don't have crap in your hair because I will not be paying attention to what you're saying. The second thing to happen in the woods is Carl and his crush Enid are hiding in a hollow tree so they can avoid the walkers and Carl tries a subtle hand touch to get things going but then he shies away from it. Mission failed. We'll get them next time. The last woodland activity to talk about is Aaron and Daryl looking for the source of the light and then coming across another walker with a W etched into its head. So whoever they're looking for, they're close by. The episode ends with a massive scrap between Rick and Jesse's husband and then Rick rants at Deanna about the new world and how things have to be. Luckily though, Michonne shuts Rick up before he ruins this new relationship beyond repair. I'm not going to stand by. <laughs> The opening shows Morgan surviving alone in the woods when all of a sudden he's approached by a strange looking man with a W on his head. And even though this guy is trying to rob Morgan for all he has, Morgan just responds back to him like they're friends, devoid of fear or even concern for the situation. You shitting me? No, I shit you not. <laughs> When the mugger ups his game and a friend joins in, Morgan responds in kind by beating them with a stick, using some neat moves we never knew he had. You may be wondering why this mugger guy didn't use his gun, but it turns out the gun was empty. 
Michonne and the others are explaining to Rick that his outburst has led to a community meeting later tonight, where they're most likely going to vote to kick him out. Rick and Carol talk about handling this in a way that suggests that they're willing to resort to violent protests, whereas Michonne wants them to just be civil about it. Maggie does the very smart thing by talking with Deanna separately, explaining Rick's actions and how their experience out on the road has molded their behaviour, but it doesn't mean they're bad people for being like this. Aaron and Daryl were tracking this stranger in red, but they lost the trail just outside of a food truck depot. Aaron says they need to stop the chase and take this opportunity to gather food for the community. Daryl opens one of the trucks, which turns out to be a trap that opens all of the trucks, containing a crap load of walkers. They're quickly surrounded and attempt to make their way through the crowds, but then they wind up taking cover in this nearby car. The idea that some mysterious group of people are taking the time to carve W's into Walker's heads and also set up weird booby traps like this, it keeps you watching with anticipation of the types of people they will turn out to be. We've already met one of them who is more creepy than an actual threat. Put that down. Why? Because I want it. So we can assume that he was just a low-ranking scout, and the real threat is yet to reveal themselves. Daryl counts them down to make their escape, but before he finishes, the walker gets a hole poked in its head, and it turns out to be Morgan who's come to the rescue. Morgan states that he rescued them because all life is precious now. Clearly, he's still a bit loopy in the brain. Gabriel goes out on a walk, feeling enlightened that he has the protection of God, and he's now ready for whatever comes his way. But when a walker goes to bite him, he caves into reality and finally kills one. When he returns, the guy asks him to close the gate behind him, but Gabriel's too preoccupied with conflicting thoughts to check that he closed the gate properly, so this is probably going to have consequences. Glenn is tracking the liar guy through the woods, and when they finally scuffle, Glenn is set upon by three walkers. And this, my friends, marks the first of many times Glenn has a miraculous escape. Look at how vulnerable he is here, and tell me it's not a miracle that he got out alive. I really want to call BS on this, but trust me, there's a moment later in the series that I'm definitely going to draw out the BS card on. Glenn catches up with him by nightfall and is almost at the point of killing him, but he chooses not to, presumably being tired of all the conflict and death he's been around, and so he helps him get back to the community, a community which is now holding the meeting to decide Rick's fate. Pretty much everyone defends Rick, and the man himself proves his worth as he kills the walkers who got through the gate. But just as his case is about to be won in a civilised manner, Jesse's husband walks in with a sword looking for revenge, and as Deanna's husband intervenes, he gets slain sliced up. <laughs> Deanna looks at Rick in realisation that he's exactly the guy she needs to keep this community safe and gives him the go ahead to do what he needs to do. Do it. Two other cool things happen that we should mention. The first is Sasha going to Gabriel for guidance on how to grieve for Bob. And instead, he calls her a sinner who doesn't deserve to be here. The dead don't choose, but the choices you made, how you sacrificed your own. Sasha loses it with him and holds a gun to his head. But then Maggie comes along and convinces them that at times like this, where they all feel lost, they can come together in their joint belief in a higher power. I don't personally subscribe to this particular belief, but it's still heartwarming to see. The second cool thing to happen is we see the weird mugger guy and his friend using music and lights to usher the walkers back into the food trucks. And at this point, I'm fully invested into this show again. Some of the episodes in these past two seasons have left me feeling a bit iffy. But like I say, this right here restores my faith. Morgan arrives in Alexandria with Aaron and Daryl, with Morgan and Rick exchanging looks of disbelief. This finale was so much better than season four, and I'm excited to see what comes next. <laughs>